All right. Hey, today I want to talk to you about how AI writers are impacting blog niche selection. So the advent of AI writers, uh, you know, Jasper, for example, came out over two years ago. And now we have so many more products like Jasper, uh, Zim Writer, Agility Writer, Koala Writer. I mean, there's just a lot of really well put together, very usable, very mature AI writing tools out on the market now. And I think that these tools are making it easier for you to select a blog niche because you know what? You're not going to be probably writing most of these posts yourself. You may be curating the posts, but you're not necessarily writing them from scratch. So, you know, conventional wisdom says this list that I've got here, passion, target audience, competitive analysis, monetization potential, keyword research, expertise, scalability, and enjoyment and motivation seem to be this overarching list that I see when I watch YouTube videos for picking a niche. Not everybody says this, but it, a lot of the uh, niche information about choosing a niche does seem to be somewhat outdated in this day of AI writing. Um, because I'm just cognizant of the fact that everybody's using AI writing tools. If you're writing, still writing from scratch, um, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Uh, it's a lot of work to do it that way. Um, and when I look at that overarching list, there are four items that I immediately just get rid of and focus on things like target audience, the competitive analysis piece, the monetization potential, and the keyword research. So, you know, passion... You don't have to be passionate about a particular blog topic to curate or write about it. Um, and now with the AI writers being so good at pulling factual data, you don't necessarily have to be an expert. The, you know, there are some caveats around that. And we'll talk about it in a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about why scalability isn't such a big thing anymore. Uh, and, you know, I don't need to be, I don't need to have enjoyment or motivation to write a blog. Uh, there's other reasons why uh, I would blog besides enjoyment and motivation. So basically for target audience, this is important. I think it's important for you to know your audience. You need to have at least a cursory understanding of what they like, what they dislike, what their buying habits are. Uh, and you know, the over, overarching thing with understanding a target audience is can you solve their problems? Because people come to blogs, mainly they want to get questions answered and maybe look at product reviews, which does answer questions about what to purchase. Um, so it's that kind of thing that you're going to be creating in a blog to help a target audience out. So you do need to understand who they are and what they need. So monetization potential. Uh, this is really important, um, and it goes hand in hand with understanding your target audience. So, you know, does my audience buy the majority of the related goods and services online? So, you know, are there going to be enough affiliate programs in the niche that you choose? Uh, or are you going to try and sell an information product or maybe, you know, consulting services? So the whole point is, you know, can you make money and how much money do you need to make? Now, for some of us, we just need to make some side money. You know, the blog is a side hustle. For other people, they're trying to spin up a lot of blogs uh, so they can eventually, you know, blog full time and do it on their own. I've only done it as a side hustle, so I certainly can't speak to some people that are doing it full time. Uh, but I just wanted to explain why understanding your target audience and thinking about monetization is important. Um, I've mentioned in the past that I have this blog called aboutflyfishing.com and I use it for conducting SEO experiments. Uh, even though I do have Amazon affiliate links on it, I'm not trying to make any money on it. And here's why. Here's why understanding your target audience is important. So, People that fly fish, they buy almost all of their equipment at fly shops. And there's a reason that they do this. Um, 
when you fly fish, you want to test a fly rod out before you buy it. You rarely ever buy a fly rod sight unseen unless you're getting a killer deal on a used rod. Same thing with reels. Uh, you might buy fly line online. You might buy some of the smaller incidental products online. But these smaller products are not very expensive. We're talking, you know, products that could be from, you know, $3 to $50. So you're never going to sell a $700 high-end fly rod through a blog. You're just not. And there's a reason for this too. If you go to Amazon, the reason you don't see a lot of fly rods from the major manufacturers or a lot of fly reels from the major manufacturers is they don't allow people to sell their products for a lower cost on Amazon than what you could, what you'd pay if you walked into a fly shop. So, so that's why I use this site for SEO experimentation, but I would never try to make money at it. It's just it's not the right target audience. They like to go in and talk to people about their purchases. Uh, fly shops are sort of this place like a barber shop where, you know, people go in and talk about their fly fishing experiences and try rods out and look at reels and look at lines. And that's where they do most of their shopping because they know they can't go online and get it any cheaper because there's agreements between the manufacturers and the online retailers that the prices in the shop and the prices online have to be the same. So I know that was a little long-winded, but I wanted to explain that because you want to make sure that you're not picking a niche like fly fishing where there are some rules around pricing structures and things like that that could make it difficult for you to sell products. Um, and some products you just have to, uh, you know, hold in your hand and use. Um, you know, if you've never fly fished before, you won't understand this, but there is a difference between a $300 fly rod and a $1,000 fly rod. And when you're casting it, you can tell the difference, but until you have it in your hand, you won't know. And so you're never going to get these big high-end sales. And, you know, you need to be careful, too, that whatever it is that you're trying to um, blog about, that people actually buy products on a regular basis. So some of these high-end products may be a one-and-done deal, and the people never buy a thing in that category or that high-end price range for years. So um, you just need to know... Are there enough affiliate programs for your niche? You know, are there plenty of products that you can market and review and test and sell? Uh, that's going to make a big difference. Even if you just have a cursory understanding of the, of the niche that you're considering, you've got to make sure it's got monetization potential. Because if it doesn't and you don't sell any products, guess what? That blog that you're writing, you're just going to give up on it. You're going to go, this is crazy. Why am I spending all this time on this thing and not making a dime? So another thing that you want to think about is keyword research. So there are a lot of keyword research tools. But before you pick a niche, you want to take something like I happen to use Low Fruits as my keyword research tool, but some keyword research tool even if you just get Ahrefs for a month or SEMrush for a month, uh, whatever you decide to do, you need to make sure that when you uh, are looking at keywords, can you find at least 150 long tail keywords that you can write informational blog posts about? Um, if you can't, then I would probably steer away from that niche uh, because now I think with the advent of bulk writing tools that are available in uh, a lot of the different AI writers, it's going to be important that you have a long list of keywords that you can write articles about. Uh, and it used to be, you know, hey, I need a minimum of 100 articles for a blog to really take off. I'm thinking now it's going to approach more at the 250 or 300 mark because Many of these tools do bulk writing, like I use Koala Writer. It has a bulk writing tool. I can go into Low Fruits 
and I can get my list of keywords that it's generated and drop it in Koala Writer and walk away. And if I put 150 keywords in, it'll generate 150 articles for me. So from a scalability standpoint, um, all, most of these tools have bulk writing capability and are quite scalable. So keyword research is very important. And then competitive analysis. The one thing that you do want to take into consideration is who is your competition going to be? And is there some kind of room where you can carve out some space for your niche? Um, and the only way you can do that is to use a keyword tool and put in some keywords that are very common for a niche. So for example, you know, I would put in for fly fishing, I would just use that generic fly fishing uh, seed keyword. And then I'd start to look at the SERPs. So, the, so for example, low fruits will uh, provide me with a list of keywords for um, my particular uh, niche, which in this case, I've been using the example fly fishing. Then I can go in and look at the, at the domain authority of many of the competitors that I'd be up against. And so if you see that, you know, there's lots of high, high domain authority websites and not many low ones, uh, it's going to be tough to break in to the top 10. Now, if your keyword research tool shows you that there's a lot of lower domain authority websites in the niche that you're considering, um, and many of them have maybe the, they're in the top 10 for your selected 150 long tail keywords, then guess what? That's a good niche. You may want to go in there and, and, and compete with those because, you know, if they're low domain authority, so you're going to be that way too. And you're going to be able to get, to get some articles ranking. So the big deal is, you know, is there an audience for your blog niche? Can it be monetized? And can you compete? Are there enough other blogs with low domain authorities that you can actually go in and, um, you know, capture some of that traffic that they've captured? I, I think as long as you can do a little bit of fact checking, you can write about anything practically now. The one caveat that I'll give you is health and finance. So that's sometimes called YMYL, your money or your life. Uh, it's important, at least in those niches, that you do have some level of expertise. So if you're writing about medical conditions, right, you'd want to be a doctor or you'd at least want to have some kind of medical certifications. Same thing with finance. When you're giving financial advice, you, you want to make sure uh, that you know what you're talking about when people are uh, looking at your content and making decisions about their own personal uh, money, right? You, you want to be a financial, a certified financial advisor, or you want to have some kind of accreditations that show that you actually know what you're talking about in the financial area. So um, the one thing that I'll point out is if you're curious about YMYL, just do a Google search on it and you can read lots and lots of articles about why YMYL makes a difference. So, you know, when you're choosing your blog niche, if it's going to be finance or, or medical, um, you definitely want to read some posts about this and understand uh, what it is you're getting into. So that's about it. Um, I hope you found this helpful. I just tried to pair the key things, the key components for choosing a niche down to just make it simple for you, get out of the analysis paralysis, start curating your articles as quickly as possible, get your blog spun up, and hopefully that'll lead to making some money as well. Until next time, take care.